Welcome to the Retail Focus Podcast, a weekly collection of news, interviews, and information from the world of retail. Here are your hosts, Trent Kling and Leighton Kling. Welcome to the Retail Focus Podcast with Trent and Leighton Kling. Coming up on today's show, we're starting to get the holiday shopping forecast out, so we'll discuss that. We'll also discuss a zombie retailer coming back from the proposed dead to make a return to brick-and-mortar retail this week. And we'll discuss Sears Hometown and Outlet Stores as their earnings call gives us a little bit more clarity on the upcoming merger deals now, or the upcoming buyout deals, two of them that they've got in the works. A reminder to like us, rate us wherever you do find us, whether that be on Apple Podcasts or iTunes or Spotify, you get the idea. You can also check us out at Retail Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. So again, our opening story here, potentially great news for retailers as recent holiday shopping forecasts project a potential substantial climb in holiday sales. Late in these studies come from Deloitte, who we've mentioned a lot on the podcast, and also Alex Partners. These studies came out this week. The NRF will release their forecast later this fall, but Honestly, good numbers forecast from these two forecasters. Yeah, great numbers overall if you're a fan of retail or if you're just looking at the economy and seeing what it could potentially do for the coming months. We shouldn't be surprised by the numbers all that much as monthly year-over-year sales continue to increase by solid margins. As an example, the NRF produced numbers on August retail sales, which were up 4.6%, Trent, unadjusted over last year excluding, of course, gasoline, restaurant, and automobile sales. Jack Kleinhens, the chief economist at the NRF, said that although growth in August slowed over July, consumer spending is still at a substantial level. That said, he noted that tariffs may present downside risks to household spending, and we keep hearing that. However, it remains unclear as to what exactly consumers would really pull back on, in terms of that consumer spending, that week-over-week week spending, if you will, the, the normal items that families tend to buy day after day, the, the milk and eggs, if you will, of the world, I don't think a lot of that's going to be affected by any tariff downside. But even still, the three-month moving average after August is up 4.1% over a year ago. Speaking of these numbers, an interesting finding of note, the grocery and beverage store category saw a 4.9% increase year-over-year year in August, well outpacing inflation and showing the potential for a strong holiday season. Also interesting, Trent, and tied in with our own story, our own next story, electronics and appliance store sales were actually down 2.9% year over year in August. Back to the original story here, as two main research firms here noted that we could see year over year increases in line with what we've seen in the last two months during the holiday shopping season, which is substantial if you think back for the last couple of years holiday sales growth has been immense very very profitable for retailers deloitte's annual survey which we reference every year shows the potential for 4.5 to 5 percent growth year over year and for top line sales to exceed 1.1 trillion dollars that's trillion with a t last year sales growth was generally believed to be around three percent to 3.5 percent depending on what data you use. So while this isn't surprising given the last few months, this is a substantial leap in expectations from what we've seen during the last few holiday seasons, with the exception of two years ago, that is. And Rod Sides with Deloitte did note that this expected growth is larger than what even retailers were expecting. As far as Deloitte's forecast is concerned, they see a potential for around 13% of overall holiday sales to touch the digital channel in some way, a continued increase in year-over-year sales through that metric. Remember, as a whole, digital sales are still said to make up less than 10% of overall sales. And you look, however, this number is skewed somewhat by lower digital sales numbers we see from the grocery sector, of course, although there have been advancements in this category for the likes of Walmart and Kroger over the past couple of years. Additionally, retailers like Dollar Tree, Family Dollar, Dollar General, who still have a solid share of the merchandise category are out there. Granted, not as high as Walmart, but you see digital sales coming in well below 5%. Deloitte's digital shares forecast is actually driven by e-commerce growth of 14 to 18%, outpacing growth of 11.2% last holiday season. So certainly 
those adjustments from those bigger retailers are making an impact. So let's look at what Alex Partners study came out with. Now, Alex Partners forecasts a little bit more uncertainty than Deloitte's, and this shows in the spread of potential growth they forecast. So their forecast for the holiday season growth is between 4.4% and 5.3%. So that's nearly a half percent larger spread on expectations than Deloitte's, who had it pinned down to about a half percent there. The reason Alex Partners did this and had this large spread is that they said they basically are seeing unprecedented uncertainty that might not be a bad thing for retail i guess if you especially factor in the fact that market confidence could remain up consumer confidence could remain up but again a few different reasons for their own bullish predictions because they're still forecasting a fairly large sale gain most notably they said hey it's because of lapping those market downturns last year's fourth quarter that we saw that kind of eroded customer confidence. Also, last year's government shutdown took money out of some people's pockets as they were getting ready to spend. Those were factors that negatively affected sales in 2018. As such, 2018 sales came in on the lower end of expected guidance, as Leighton already mentioned, just above 3% for the holiday season. And the market downturn, as I mentioned, it was thought by a lot of people that it had an impact on consumer confidence right as things were getting into December. So it's possible that that had an impact on a lot of those late holiday season shopping rushes there because you were seeing, it. you go back to that time just on a macro level, you were seeing generally speaking about 3 4% drops some days in the Dow, in the S&P 500. So that of course made its way to the news. A lot of people then became kind of suspect of where things were headed as an economy. A lot of people started thinking and talking about a recession, so they were a little bit more worried, the theory goes, to spend money. That said, Alex Partners, cognizant of the same potential issues popping up this year, and mentioned that uncertainty surrounding tariffs specifically and tariff impacts on retail and the market as a reason for the large spread. Now, generally speaking, in earnings calls over the last few months, we've seen retailers either maintain full-year guidance or increase guidance, particularly noting strength going into the third and fourth quarters. CNBC notes that, of course, Walmart and Target have increased full-year guidance, although this has been seen with other retailers as well. Some retailers, like the aforementioned Dollar Tree, haven't boosted guidance in terms of what they think the ceiling might be with earnings per share and some of their sales ceilings, but they've brought up the lower end of expectations. And you see this happen sometimes as retailers get halfway through the year, they kind of hone in on where they think they're going to be at year's end. And we see this with Dollar Tree where they actually brought up the lower end of their expectations. So basically narrowing the range of expectations, but narrowing it upward as the year has progressed. Now, one thing I did want to drive home, and one of the reasons that we're talking about it here, because it seems like most years there's a positive holiday shopping outlook. As, as Leighton mentioned, three years ago, it was a, a difficult holiday shopping season, to say the least, for retailers, even though you saw a bit of an increase there. So that's why two years ago, you saw the big jump from where things were at three years ago. But these recent projections fly in the face of Wells Fargo's projections for a weaker than expected holiday shopping season, as they announced in August. Now, Wells Fargo analyst Ike Boroshow suggested impacts from a warmer winter season and a shorter holiday calendar might keep sales from hitting those expected numbers. And these are the expectations set by retailers. He said that in particular, six fewer days between Thanksgiving and Christmas may hamper retailers' efforts. However, data we've cited from a number of firms, including those like Cardlytics, suggest that more and more shoppers are choosing to do their holiday spending earlier, perhaps mitigating the expected impact of fewer days. The other mitigation of this impact of fewer days is the fact that you're really spreading out the holiday shopping season as a whole because you're seeing more sales earlier in the week, you're seeing more sales before Black Friday come out, and you're seeing more lingering sales after Black Friday. So it's more of a week-long event than anything. It's basically adding days to the shopping season. And as far as the warmer weather issue, while it's true that this may impact seasonal apparel retailers, less severe weather events may also make it easier for people to get out and shop. And this is something sometimes we hear from retailers regarding fourth quarter and first quarter earnings calls when they come out is that, well, hey, there were some severe weather events, some blizzards, 
that type of thing that impacted people's ability to actually get out and shop, particularly on the grocery store front. We literally just talked about this a few weeks ago when we talked about the potential impacts of Hurricane Dorian. Same thing is true when it comes to winter weather. So while this may impact those retailers that rely on apparel, rely on that seasonal apparel sales to fuel those sales in the fourth quarter, in terms of other retailers, you're looking at general merchandise retailers, grocery retailers, and the like, having fewer of those severe events and having a warmer weather season tends to get people out more. The other thing on a macro level that I think is important to keep in mind is we talk a lot about how, you know, A-class malls aren't dying. They're still relatively healthy. It's the B and C-class malls, especially like the B-minus malls that are struggling. What you're seeing replacing a lot of those aren't necessarily shopping malls, but outdoor shopping complexes. Leighton, I know you've got a ton of those where you live in California. I've got a few of them where I live in Colorado. Actually, there's about three substantial outdoor shopping malls within about 45 minutes of me. But I, all these areas I visit throughout the country, that's kind of the new biggest thing. And when you have a warmer weather shopping season, these outdoor shopping areas are going to be more frequented because people can walk from store to store. It makes it easier. You don't want to go to those places if it's 20 degrees and it's icing or snowing outside. So all of that, to me, means that, yeah, you'll see some impact, certainly. And I think it's indisputable that you do see impact at apparel retailers when you don't have those weather changes from season to season or they're very substantial. But at the same time, I think it can increase traffic to those retailers. And the other thing Wells Fargo noted was concern over inventory growth versus sales growth so far in 2019. And I get that this is a concern for some retailers. You look at the likes of JCPenney. This growth might be because of flagging sales, less than stellar inventory control mechanisms. JCPenney, one of those retailers that's tried to shed off some of those inventory marks. But many retailers are seeing an increase in inventory for other reasons, notably tariffs. And this is something that in their report, Wells Fargo kind of referenced and they said, hey, this is going on, but we're really worried about inventory levels increasing versus sales increasing. But how many earnings calls? Have we discussed where retailers openly noted that they were attempting to stockpile inventory in anticipation of tariffs? Quite a few, to be honest with you. And we're talking not about one segment of retail. We're talking about a number of segments of retail. Obviously, off-price companies have been stockpiling inventory because of tariffs, but also because of good buying opportunities on the market. Something we mentioned when discussing Ross's earnings call a few weeks ago, but it's also something that comes up when we talk about Ollie's Bargain Outlet, when we talk about TJX. And more and more people are going to these off-price companies as a mechanism of shopping for the holidays. But also you have electronics retailers, you have retailers in toys and general merchandise, you have retailers in various segments that are trying to get the buying done before any other potential tariffs come in. As a result, you're seeing those inventory levels increase. The companies have been very transparent about this. And so I think, I don't know that this is an oversight necessarily for Wells Fargo because they did mention this in this note about three weeks ago. But again, you're looking at a situation where companies are doing this intentionally to try and avoid those impacts from tariffs so that there isn't that worry for them when they do turn into the fourth quarter. And I'll make sure to mention Wells Fargo didn't say that sales would fall, just that they would come in under expectations. But we see a number of reasons why their bearishness might be unfounded, especially in light of these most recent studies who still find, on the whole, a very strong consumer and a continued push towards digital channels as a mechanism of convenience. Yeah, and all that being said, Trent, holiday sales in 2019 will likely come down to consumer sentiment. Basically, can the market ward off a sell-off like what we saw in the fourth quarter of 2018 to keep consumer sentiment high? Also, can concerns about tariffs be quelled by at least a number of things out there long enough to keep from weighing on the American consumer? Time will tell, but we will likely see a potential growth in sales of at least around maybe 4.5% even with those factors in the balance. So a very good holiday shopping season headed for both us and the retailers and the consumer. Very, very eager to report on all of the happenings with that.
The latest in a string of zombie retailers, Trent H.H. H. Gregg, makes a somewhat unexpected return to the brick-and-mortar retail segment this week. This follows a trend with Circuit City, Toys R Us, both making comebacks in the recent past. Of all of the brands we thought would reemerge from bankruptcy, I think we both had H.H. Gregg fairly low on the list, if only because of questions about anyone's ability to survive with their particular product mix two years ago. And no, it doesn't seem like that long ago. Brands like Sears and Best Buy were actually vying for the rights to some of H.H. Gregg properties on the auction block. And in particular, things like their website and customer files are valuable in circumstances like this. We saw Michael's bid for Hancock Fabrics holdings in bankruptcy auction for this exact reason. That customer data is actually a larger piece of the company's infrastructure. If you look at when a company sells off, if they had been collecting data, it is extremely valuable for those competing companies. Trademarks and brand names are also traditionally auctioned off. In rare cases, like with Toys R Us, these are very, very valuable. And actually, in that particular case, of course, a lot of those were actually held by the seller. So maybe not as much so with H.H. Gregg here. We look at the circumstances surrounding the company. And it was a company called Valor Group that outbid everyone for H.H. Gregg's properties. And they are the company that is opening the new location. And the big story in this second go-round at H.H. Gregg is the size of the store that opened. So similar to Reborn, Toys R Us, and Circuit City stores, H.H. Gregg's new store it's much smaller than its prior iteration at about 2,000 square feet, by the way. They also changed the naming convention because the naming convention used to be all lowercase, but in this particular press release, they had increased the H's to uppercase, just something that we noticed. Most H.H. Gregg stores, by the way, same logo, were around the 20 to 30,000 square foot size, so slightly smaller than the average Best Buy that you went to, but slightly larger than a company like Bed Bath & Beyond, let's say. Eli Safardi, who's the director of retail operations at Valor Group, implied to the Franklin reporter and advocate who kind of originally broke this story that customers were maybe intimidated by the large store size. His exact term was overwhelmed, and I think that's a convenient way to look at it if the direction you're going is with these smaller stores, but based on Best Buy's sales trends of late and the struggles of some of their smaller format Best Buy mobile stores, now granted different product selection there, we're not entirely sure that this is the case. But again, when you look at HH Gregg, the company, Valor Group, said, hey, we were able to go through all of these customer files, all of this customer data from millions of customers, and we were able to kind of hone things in and see what specifically these customers wanted, particularly in terms of product selection, and they feel like they can do it all in a 2,000 square foot store. As is the circumstance with most smaller format stores, a greater emphasis is being placed on personal interactions with customers. That's actually something Leighton will talk about when we discuss our visits to retailers over the last couple of weeks. But it seems as though they're kind of aiming to borrow from the approach of retailers like Warby Parker, like Indochino, like the Apple retail stores, and focus on those one-on-one -on -one interactions and do so within a smaller footprint. He said also that they have experts, he being Safardi, said that they have experts in the consumer electronics field for customers to converse with. The key is, and this is always the key when it comes to a retail store that claims to have these experts, will people trust those experts more than similar people installed at Apple or even Samsung's new retail outlets? H.H. Gregg is saying that they're going to carry both Apple and Samsung's products in their new retail stores that they're coming out with? Or will they trust them more than Best Buy's experts, the Geek Squad folks at Best Buy? So that's a big question. Will people think H.H. Gregg first and foremost in this New Jersey location or near this New Jersey location to seek them out to get input on these electronic products that are hitting the market, not just to try out those electronics products, but also to buy them with the assistance of these employees. One of the more interesting aspects of the store, Layton, there's a nearby warehouse space that supports inventory, which allows for this smaller square footage. So instead of having a twenty to 30,000 square foot store where 5,000 square feet or more 
warehouse space and you've got a lot of product out on the floor and a lot of product on the shelves, they're taking more of a, a showroom approach, not an entirely showroom approach, but more of a showroom approach. So from a real estate perspective, what are some of the things that they need to keep in mind and what are some of the reasons they might be doing this? No doubt about it, warehouse space is usually cheaper than store space, so there is some cost savings realized with this. However, logistically, how this will be executed will determine the long-term success of the concept. If you think about it, Trent, having a, sort of a distribution center right off of the actual retail store is going to be interesting because how exactly are you going to fulfill orders? Are you going to have customers shuttling back and forth to that particular store? Is it going to be a waste of money? So basically, how efficient is this setup going to be for the store? And I think this is very, very odd because, Trent, a lot of times you don't see this in modern retail. You see maybe some more off-site distribution. And honestly, I think this is something that we're going to have to wait and see to see how they're going to play this out. But overall, it's going to be a head scratcher if they aren't as efficient as maybe they should be with this type of concept. That said, the HH Greg website is still very much operational, albeit with a slightly different product mix than the original chain. The online inventory is a far greater percentage of specialty electronics and goes easier on the home appliances. It is in part because the shift in inventory that Valor endeavored to open a retail store in the first place. They said that customers desire interaction with products before buying them, which makes sense. And they wanted to open a store through which that could take place. And I think honestly, Trent, a lot of people want that hands-on experience still, especially with the product selection that they are proposing. So I think this is a smart move on behalf of the new HH Greg concept. However, is it going to still be viable and compete with the likes of their competitors? I think, honestly, this is a question that a lot of people are going to be having. Luckily for them, the overhead costs seem to be a lot, a lot, substantially lower than their previous concept stores that had to close. And I think the biggest question is, how do they prop themselves up against their main brick and mortar competition with a 2,000 square foot store? Because... Obviously, you're not going to have the product mix that you might have in a Best Buy, you know, 30 or 40,000 square foot store. And when a lot of people go to these electronics retailers, sure, we think about the big purchases, the televisions, the refrigerators, as far as the home appliances are concerned, the computers, the devices. But a lot of people go to these stores for smaller things, especially Best Buy. When you look at the level of selection that they have, surrounding things like, oh, I'll say, PC gaming, for example. They've got a lot of optionality there with different products that help to cater to that population. HH Craig is kind of doing the same thing surrounding cameras, which was one of their more popular categories. But the question is, is that going to stand out? Is that going to be enough to stand out from Best Buy when you're talking about overall product mix? Is this location actually going to drive traffic? Or is it going to be something there where the employees are just waiting around for customers who are on the website in this New Jersey area to come and try the products? Well, like we mentioned, time will tell, but it's just very difficult to see how they're going to compete full on with someone like Best Buy. But in terms of survival, a little bit easier, as you mentioned, Layton, to survive with the 2,000 square foot store. So we start up the next segment of the Retail Focus Podcast, a somewhat recurring segment that we've done just over the last couple of months, talking about retailers that we visited in the recent past. So I was in Phoenix all of last week. The reason a podcast didn't end up getting recorded, I was there on business. I'll talk a little bit about some of the dynamics that I saw there. But Leighton, I know you visited a few different retailers this week, the most notable of which REI. What were your experiences with them in terms of the locations that you visited? Yeah, so the, the REI store was in Tustin, California, and this was actually the first time I went inside an REI. The experience was actually really good. Uh, it was a smaller store than I thought it was going to be, but I went in initially because they were the only store open until 8 p.m. that could fix bicycles. I had a flat tire on my bicycle, my road bicycle, and it was interesting because the level of service was extremely great. Like It was the best service I had ever had relating to bicycle service ever. And we're talking about specialty bike shops that are supposed to really do much better job than big box stores. But REI, they had a ton of staff working. Uh, the store was actually really, really busy. And we're talking about, again, late in a Sunday afternoon. They had a ton of customer support. 
And I think it's interesting, Trent. The only downside that I could really tell, through my experience at least, is that they require you to sign up in in a way that takes off almost more time than it does to actually fix the bicycle. So I, uh, it felt like I had to give a blood sample just to get a work order in. But aside from that, the level, again, the level of service, not only with actually fixing my bicycle, but processing all the information and making sure the transaction went smoothly was absolutely amazing. There were at least four or five employees in the bicycle section alone. And if you look in the upper rafters, you could see bicycles that were on hold from previous service orders, bikes that had either been completed or that were pending service. So you could see the amount of people that were going in REI for bicycle service. Incredible. So it's apparently not just me, but I think a lot of people are acknowledging that not only the level of service, but even the price for that service is extremely competitive. It was about five or ten dollars less overall for the service that I had gotten than a typical bike shop. Again, a specialty mom and pop bike shop would have charged me. So I think the store was a very well-run store. And if we're talking about service here with this particular location, I had actually gone over to the shoe section of the store because I, I need some new running shoes. So I needed to try some on. I'm a fan of Saucony shoes. I My current shoes are, are pretty worn out and out of date. But in terms of service there too, in the shoe section, it seemed as though employees were almost tripping over each other to try to get to me to see what I wanted help with. And I think that is extremely important for that type of scenario. We talked about Dick Sporting Goods a couple of years ago and my experience going into a Dick Sporting Goods shoe section and how it's actually changed for the worse in some cases by not holding as much inventory on the sales floor and maybe cutting back on employees here and there. It hurts immensely because the, the number one thing we all know is that shoes can be bought online and they can be bought at a competitive price point. So the thing that needs to differentiate retailers is that in-person experience, that in-person level of service. And I think REI has definitely executed to an extremely high degree. And one last thing I'll say about the store overall, I did peruse all the apparel sections, the camping sections. Honestly, the price points were pretty high, but not as high, let's say, as I had expected going into the store. And where I live in Orange County, a lot of people can afford their product mix, so I'm pretty sure it's it's fairly high for a reason. But again, they do carry very robust brands, so an overall very good experience. I would rate it a 9 out of 10. I actually had to go there a, a second time within two weeks to get yet another bicycle tire fixed, so... Either it's it's me riding or maybe just the bicycle tires aren't that great. But regardless, Trent, REI, a, a retailer that I will be visiting in the future for my bicycle service needs. And it's interesting because you mentioned hadn't really made all that many visits to an REI in the past. REI, you know, where I live in Colorado, they're almost ubiquitous, of course. And one of the things that I've always noted is it seems to capitalize the retail concept that it seems to capitalize on people having discretionary income of course so that's number one they're probably going to be a retailer that would be more affected by something like a recession if that were to happen but two they tend to capitalize on functions of people thinking they need more than what they actually do when i go to an rei someone will be buying this massive amount of backpacking gear for a two hour long hike when they might not actually need it so One of the aspects of what makes REI successful on the retail edge, of course, they do also service a number of people who are going on multi-day backpacking trips that'll need some of that merchandise. Well, as I mentioned, I was in Phoenix over the last couple of weeks on business, and again, that's why we didn't record the podcast last week, is because I didn't have room in my luggage for my typical recording equipment. So as such, I visited, of course, a number of retailers in the Phoenix area. One thing I will mention, this is a retailer that we don't really talk all that much about, but Ace Hardware has a fairly large footprint there. And of course, Ace locations are mostly independently owned. You do have some of the chains, like for example, Westlake Ace in the Midwest is fairly large and sprawling. But in Phoenix, what is unique is that most of the Ace locations are owned by individual proprietors, and they do a really good job of branding it under their individual name. I also saw use of small square footprints to actually have as much inventory as what you would see 
and the likes of a Home Depot or a Lowe's. They had basically sliders across the aisles that would allow for products to be facing on the front of the sliders as well as products back behind the sliders, basically fitting twice as much inventory in the same amount of floor space. Also, a lot of overhead storage within this store that I was in. They had overhead stacked to about 14 or 16 feet high within the store. And again, this is something I'll post pictures of on our Instagram page. But again, the individual branding was very, very clear within the store. So you felt like you were going to this particular person's Ace Hardware rather than just any old Ace Hardware. But most of the Ace Hardware stores that I visited there, and I visited several, kind of had the same concept going where they had their own signage, they had their own specific deals going on. So very interesting as far as those Ace stores. A lot of the country, you don't see Ace stores that are branded individually. They might be owned individually, but they're not necessarily branded as individual stores. For example, you know, in Colorado, most of the Ace stores are just Ace stores. They don't have anyone's name attached to it. You might see, again, the Westlake brand in the Midwest or other brands on different sides of the country. But again, it was just interesting how many different proprietors there were of Ace stores in the Phoenix area. The other thing I wanted to talk about was the grocery dynamic in Phoenix. So Phoenix is a city that I visited on a regular basis. Oh, up until the last nine years or so, I haven't really been back for nine years, but the grocery space has undertaken a bit of a renovation there. Of course, Sprouts based out of Arizona. So Sprouts has a massive footprint there, much more so than what they did nine years ago, which is about the last time I visited Phoenix. But the other thing is there had been a local grocer named Bashes. And Bashes was one of the local favorites. It's a local chain. It's native to Arizona. Number of locations throughout Arizona, throughout the Phoenix area, down on into Tucson as well. And one of the things I noticed is that Bashes, you know, of course, they, they went through some financial difficulty several years back. But as a result of that, their stores haven't really been able to keep up with the demands of customers, it doesn't seem like. And as such, it seems like the popularity of their brand has seen significant shrinkage over the last five to 10 years. And again, 10 years ago when I would go to Arizona, one of the most popular retailers that was there, now they've been overtaken by Fry's. Fry's, of course, has the backing of Kroger, so they're able to do a lot more advertising. They've got the click list program. You see billboards everywhere for it there. But also Fry's is building out some of their larger locations. You see some of the marketplace style locations in Phoenix as well. And they're able to differentiate on product mix because of that corporate backing. So you see one company that's really had financial struggles in bashes. The other company in Fry's has the backing of a multi-billion dollar institution in Kroger. As such, you've seen that market share really turn around. But what really struck me is the emergence of Smart and Final Extra as one of the main grocery retailers in certain parts of the city, particularly out in the suburbs. And we think of Smart and Final kind of as one of those warehouse grocery retailers. But the Smart and Final locations in Phoenix were actually very, very well kept, almost immaculate in terms of the store look. I would say better kept than Bash's stores, which is unusual to see after comparing those two again just 10 years ago. But you go out there and the Smart and Final stores have a larger organic selection. They've got an enormous produce section where the produce isn't just sitting there and, and rotting. They've got, you know, the beer and wine selection is fairly well built out for the store. And again, you know, we're talking about a chain that's very popular in California, but they're making inroads in Phoenix. So really in Phoenix, you've got, to me, three players to watch. Fries, of course, under the Kroger banner. Sprouts is always going to be a force there because, again, they're headquartered there. They have a massive brand recognition, but you're starting to see Smart and Final develop. Right now, they only have a handful of locations in the Phoenix area, but I would not at all be surprised to see Smart and Final kind of build that out. You also see a substantial footprint from a company like Trader Joe's, for example, in that area. But again, I think you know, Sprouts kind of has the inroad there to Trader Joe's and a lot of Trader Joe's target market. And I think as far as the value grocery player there to watch out for, Smart and Final Extra certainly takes the cake, especially when you compare the square footage of their stores to options in other markets, such as at Aldi, for example. Sears Hometown and Outlet Stores, amidst a pending purchase agreement, issues earnings that are subpar, to say the least. There was literally a section of the earnings release called Second Quarter Performance Highlights. Well, let me just cut to the chase here. There were really no positive highlights. It wasn't that long ago that Sears Hometown and Outlet Stores were outperforming Sears Holdings in terms of sales growth 
and other notable metrics that we talk about here on the podcast. No longer is this the case, Trent. First, the numbers, the first highlight is actually a comp store sales decrease of 21.7% in the second quarter. This was just about the worst number we've seen since we started doing the podcast. These sales figures relate only to their hometown stores as the outlet stores are not included in this quarter's earnings because of their anticipated status as a discontinued operation. This is actually something we wanted to mention on the show since the last time we discussed very briefly the Liberty Tax deal, it has been revealed that the sale to Liberty Tax is inclusive of the Buddies locations and outlet divisions only in our hurry to record the prior podcast in which we discussed this. We recorded prior to the point where this info was available. So our apologies to our listening audience on that one. You can look through all of the details, that is, of the Liberty Tax deal online. As it relates back to the earnings story, despite the massive decline in same-store sales, increased loss per share wasn't seen as they only lost $0.80 per share in line with what we had seen in the past in the same quarter of last year. Part of this is because they've been able to really keep selling general and administrative expenses in line, which is good, as this declined in lockstep with sales. In fact, SG&A decreased a whopping 34.8% in real dollars, that is, which is an outstanding figure, meaning that they basically maybe anticipated revenue declines and therefore cut either staffing levels altogether or were able to trim back on hours where applicable. Yeah, and they they actually went into how selling general and administrative expenses were able to decline for them. It was across the board. It was everything. Lower expenses from stores closed. So, of course, they closed more stores, so they didn't have all of those expenses, which, by the way, the fact that they closed stores in the quarter is remarkable. The fact that we see a comp store sales decrease of 21.7% in the second quarter, since those are the stores that actually stayed open, although we've talked in the past about a lot of franchisees kind of aging out of the business a little bit. Also, lower commissions paid to dealers and franchisees because of that lower sales volume. So that's one of the things with a franchise operating agreement that you see when sales go down. Well, your costs are also going to go down because the franchisees are the ones that are shouldering the burden of that staffing. Reduced IT transformation investments were also mentioned. The company spent just $2 million or 1.2% of sales on IT transformation investments, lower payroll at their corporate offices, and because of that lower payroll, lower benefits, meaning there just weren't as many people there, so not as many benefits paid out. So you're looking at things transforming across the board, but again, it's easier for a franchise business to endure those sales decreases because, again, it's those franchisees that are going to be shouldering the burden. Now, their operating losses did actually decrease from last year in part because of this trend. So their operating losses were $17.2 million in the second quarter of last year. This year, $16.0 million. And again, lower SG&A factoring big time into that. And you also have lower interest expense building into their decrease in net loss. Their net loss decreasing over last year's prior quarter as well. So some positives, I guess, if you want to spin it that way, but basically it's because they don't have as many stores open. They're not paying as many franchisees. And so because of that, the number of expenditures are going down there. Now, in terms of the financial position of the company, they did go in depth into that on the call statement. But what I wanted to mention was really how the sale of the outlet and buddy stores for the company will impact the merger for the company's outstanding shares not owned by ESL Investments. So basically, the way this deal is structured is ESL Investments initially said, hey, we're looking to buy these particular shares, $225 per share in cash to purchase the rest of the company, bring that under the Transform Holdco banner there. Uh, Transform Holdco being an ESL Investments holding, basically. So what we're looking at here is because the outlet stores and the buddy stores were sold off, and that was a component of that sale agreement to ESL Investments or to Transform Hold Co., you're seeing that price per share actually increase. So the price per share for the outstanding shares not owned by ESL Investments, which the company estimates to be just a little bit above 44% of the outstanding shares, that's actually going to increase to 325 per share in cash because the proceeds from that sale will be $121 million. 
The net effect of all of this, yeah, it might be a little bit more out of pocket for ESL Investments or Transform Hold Co. up front, but again, you're looking at a little bit of a leaner stance going forward. So they will actually retain those hometown stores within the Transform Hold Co. banner once this goes through. And again, that's all important to note because we talked on the previous show about, well, how is Liberty Tax going to differentiate from these other Sears home stores that Transform Hold Co. is in the midst of opening up? Well, as it turns out, that's not necessarily the case. They're not going to have to do that because the Sears hometown stores will be retained by Transform Hold Co. or ESL Investments. Meanwhile, the outlet stores, those are the ones being transferred to Liberty Tax. And again, that information just wasn't available because we recorded the podcast literally 30 minutes after the news broke when that came out. So that's basically how it's going to impact the company going forward. Now, the bigger question long term, we mentioned that decrease of 21.7% in terms of comp sales. How is ESL Investments, how is Transform Hold Co., how is new company leadership, once that transfer of assets does happen, how are they going to turn that around? Because that's not a good number. That's not including, of course, the stores that actually closed down. So you're looking here at a store base that was fairly successful not that long ago, about three years ago. We were hearing reports of same store sales increasing by 40 to 50 percent at some of the Steers hometown stores that were out there. Then last year, about the same time last year, a little bit earlier, in fact, last year, there were a number of Sears hometown store owners or franchisees saying, hey, what's going on with the Sears Holdings Company is really hurting our business. You heard stories about people putting signs out saying, we're not going bankrupt, we're locally owned. You had this big campaign and locally owned push from Sears Hometown Stores to try and differentiate themselves. It doesn't look like that worked out all that well because, again, you're looking at this massive same-store sales decrease. So the question going forward for the company, how are you going to turn this around? How are you going to placate franchisees? Because they feel, a lot of them do, like the brand has been eroded somewhat with what's gone on in the news over the last three to four years. So, again, uh, several dynamics here. We mentioned when we first talked about this merger agreement going public that there were probably going to be a number of legal issues coming out of it. it. Looks like most of the legal issues have been smoothed over because of Liberty Tax stepping in and buying the outlet stores and the Buddy's Home Furnishing stores. So from here, it's just a, a sit and wait. Make sure, of course, the merger agreement or the initial merger agreement goes through. Once it does, what exactly is going to happen with these stores that on the whole have not been successful over the last two years? As always, we may have a position in or against companies we discuss on the podcast. Do not invest in stocks solely on the input of the podcast hosts. We've reached the final segment of the Retail Focus podcast, a segment we call Looking Ahead, where each Layton and I take a look ahead at one story we're keeping an eye on for the next week, month, or year, and we start with Layton. My looking ahead has to do with Meyer as they finished their rollout of their shop and scan app. And honestly, Trent, this is one of the better pieces of news out there because this really highlights a grocer in Meyer or super center grocer, we should say, that is able to utilize the technology and leverage it in a way that actually competes with the likes of Kroger out there. Very, very good response in terms of this shop and scan technology. The grocer said that this was a 15-month project, so they actually started back in late 2017 in a pilot of 54 stores in Michigan, of course, in their area there where they are headquartered. And if you look overall, Trent, the response has been extremely positive, but it's actually the look and feel of the app that has customers excited. You can actually go, if you're a Meyer customer, you can actually download the Meyer mobile app and you can utilize it just like any other modern shopping app so for instance you go in the store with the app already downloaded you shop and scan the items that you want to purchase put them in your cart has a running total for your digital cart and then you go to check out and it's a fairly seamless process so you have your own self checkout lane and then you just simply scan your smartphone after that running total has been accomplished and so the idea here being that it's going to be easier for customers to get in and out of the store. This actually is in the face of what some would like to call maybe a newer way of shopping groceries in terms of the clickless platform or 
maybe Walmart's grocery pickup platform as well, where they would have other people pick out the groceries for them and they simply drive up to have that curbside pickup enforced. And, and actually, this is one of the systems that I think is going to be very prominent in the future because this allows customers to go in and shop their produce, shop all the specials that they've been actually looking at prior to actually going in the store itself. And I think this is going to be Helpful also in terms of the bottom line, because as we marked in this story, selling general administrative expenses are a real thing to keep tabs on. And I think Meyer is going to be able to do that in terms of the customer to employee ratio. You need less employees to check out customers if more customers have this app. And apparently they do. 1.5 million times has this app has been used and you see that customers are using it at an increasingly higher rate as well. So you're looking at the popular features that they are mentioning here. And I think you're going to note a lot of different promotion and marketing is going to be utilized with this app in the long term as well. And that's really what this looking ahead story is about, because it's not just about scanning the products and being able to purchase from your mobile app and getting in and out quickly in the store. While that is a main focal point for something like this, this type of technology trend, I think the big thing is going to be all of the smart tool integration that they're going to be able to utilize. So for instance, if one particular product is purchased or in your shopping cart, it could perhaps recommend another one or a complimentary good that is maybe discounted on sale, et cetera. So I think there's going to be a lot of push to increase the revenue from those who have this particular app The trick is going to be trying to find that fine line between customer experience and promotion. You don't want to alienate your customer base by giving them basically pop-up ads on your mobile app. The idea here is, again, for user experience and user engagement, not to try to push people away because you're you're pushing too many items on there or too many pop-ups on your mobile app all at the same time. So I think this is excellent for this particular retailer. I think overall, this is going to be a a very solid long-term play for Meyer, and I'm looking forward to see the expanded results since this is a now store-wide rollout. And I was in Ohio and Michigan, you have some kind of Meyer's backyard about a month ago, and I was able to use this shop and scan service just to see kind of what the optionality was like there in terms of once you got into it. I got to say, it's better than the scan bag and go system that Kroger has. I think it's more intuitive. It's easier to use. The running total is a little bit more clear. The mPerks ability within the app, for those that don't know, mPerks is Meyer's kind of native discounting program. They don't have a card like Kroger stores do, but they have mPerks coupons basically that they will give customers and they can do that through the app as well. I think all of that is really spoken to by the fact that 80% of users are repeat users of the app. So you look at downloading 1.5 million times, 80% of users are repeat users. That is an immense number. You talk about digital engagement and retail. That is at the top of the list. Not a lot of brick and mortar retailers can boast numbers like that. So a good looking ahead story there from Leighton. My looking ahead story is more of a a self-pat on the back, if you will, we're not on top of a lot of things here, obviously, in uh, on the Retail Focus podcast. We're kind of outsiders, basically. We can look at certain trends. We can sniff things out. But the one thing that, honestly, I feel like we were both kind of out in front on was this transition from stage stores of uh, being a regular line retailer to an off-price retailer after their purchase of Gordman's. And a little over a year ago, we started to notice, without a lot of fanfare and without a lot of press releases, these stage stores in smaller markets were turning to Gordman stores. Gradually, this was happening over and over again. We noticed the sales increasing for stage on the whole at these Gordman stores. Same store sales figures in the double digits at times. And We said it's probably just a matter of time until they transform their entire chain to off-price. Well, we got guidance this week from the Houston Business Journal. This exact thing is happening by the third quarter of next year. Stage is expecting to be operating about 700 stores all off price from the third quarter of fiscal 2020. So they're gradually moving all the stage stores out there, all the goodie stores out there, all of the different stores that they've got into the off price segment. They're transitioning almost completely into that segment saying, hey, this is profitable. This is the way the company needs to go. 
this is what needs to happen in order to transform the company. So the reason I'm looking ahead is, you know, to this point, they've been doing it strategically at locations that maybe haven't been performing all that well. Is this a concept that can work nationwide at all of their stores? Because they had a lot of different brands out there. Is this something that's going to be a positive thing throughout their store chain? Well, I tell you, shareholders sure seem to think so. Because share prices were up nearly 35% on trading on September 20th, which is the Friday before we're recording this podcast. 37 cents of an increase up to $1.44 per share. They had not been at those levels for quite some time as their share price had been in a steady decline. If you look at the yearly graph there, basically the last time their share price was at these type of levels was before the market downturn last December. So you see this massive boost in the share price. Obviously, shareholders are excited. Wall Street's excited. The question is, can this conversion happen at a minimal cost to them? They've already been able to kind of figure out what works and what doesn't as they convert these stores to Gordman stores. So I think they can do that. The real question is, is this a model that can work in all of their markets? But it's a benefit to them because most of these stores, you're looking at markets of anywhere between 4,000 people to 50,000 people, and they don't have the Ross, the TJ Maxx, the Marshalls of the world in those particular markets. They're too small for something like a Ross or a TJ Maxx. So what Gordman's is hoping to do, or what Stage is really hoping to do through this, is implement off-price in a smaller market, in a market that hasn't been reached by an off-price store to date. Ultimately, I personally think this is a good decision for the company, but certainly we'll be keeping our eyes on it closely as we've been doing over the last year as they started to kind of make this transformation a little bit without fanfare, and then you started to see that fanfare really pick up over the last six months. That'll do it for us here on the Retail Focus Podcast. For Leighton, I'm Trent saying so long until next time. We should be able to record a podcast one week from now as I don't have any trips scheduled late next week. So we'll be back with you in about seven days. This has been the Retail Focus Podcast. For more, visit our website at retailfocuspodcast.com and subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher. Follow us on Twitter at Retail Podcast.